Hello to everybody, thanks for uh, being here for this lecture. Uh, as uh, for the other lectures, it will be double recorded. <laughs> so I will send you the link uh, to the recording of today after the processing. It takes uh, some time because it's quite a uh, big file. So I give me the, the, the floor to Professor Kai because we are already late. Yeah, sorry for being late. We kind of uh, forgot to look at the, at the watch, so we are just well, working a little bit and then the technology issues are always interesting to progress. So uh, we spent the whole uh, of last week actually discussing and making philosophical uh, statements about transportation, the city and us. And, uh, and now we would like to do a little bit of work for today and tomorrow. So we start with uh, the models, operation research models, which are uh, which target issues at setting up the system on the supply side. In particular, deciding where to locate or to rent or to buy or to construct or whatever else to put to use facilities. And this is called location. Um, I'm taking this uh, opportunity to remind you that you have that little presentation which we call some of the main models that we are, uh, that we will be studying. So uh, a more basic notation and ideas of all those from transportation problems and method design is found there. Now if you have questions about whatever in there, don't hesitate to ask them. And uh, including through, through the work. Okay, so, okay, eventually, that will work in the morning. Okay, let's go that way. So, optimizing the system design means, in particular, to decide where we do the consolidation, the deconsolidation, the the all activities which have to do with handling the freight. You remember, I mean, in a city, freight comes from outside, needs to be distributed. Same thing, we produce things in the city and we want to ship them outside. And again, we have to collect them. And the whole idea of city logistics is not to have as many movements inside or outside as we have loads to deliver or to pick up, but to pass through an additional one or maybe even more than one uh, phases of sorting and putting together what we collect or what we have to de deliver in order to use fewer vehicles, better load and better plan. So this is why we are talking about selecting those potential facility. Now, selecting the facility is only one part of the problem because you select the facilities in order to operate. So the whole idea of the models, which are the location models and the design models in general and the ones we'll be talking about, is how do I evaluate, how do I evaluate how good my choice of facility location is. Well, in order not only on how much it costs me to open it or to operate the facility, but also how it allows me to operate within the city. Because otherwise I can select the cheapest location possible, but then it will be hell to, to use it. Very long distances, very yeah, you know, it's easy to put uh, something which is totally 50 kilometers out of the city because the costs are very low, but then you have to move a lot of vehicles and it costs, it costs you a lot. So this is what we are talking about determining usage. Now, last but not least, is what I'm pointing here. In traditional, classical, if you want, operations research model, I would say even more, more strongly in the classical decision making with, with or without mathematical support. We worry about 
costs and profits. Secondly, we worry about satisfying our customer, which normally means time and being there on time and being there on time on a regular way. The reliability that we are having in, in our in our problems right now. Increasingly, and we saw it, we see it in newspapers and we hear it even on television or in conferences, we start worrying about the impact on around us, let's put it this way. Okay? Now the city logistics movement has been created from the beginning with that idea that we want to reduce the impact of freight transportation, the negative impact of freight transportation on the city. Obviously, that's, this may take uh, the form of reducing the impact on the environment, obviously, uh, and that is done also by changing the type of motorization, going from one mode to multimodal, reducing the number of vehicles and having better routes, of course, this is, these are the main ways to do that, but also, I would say, uh, reducing the impact on the quality of life of the people who are there and the joke that I was making last week about not locating a distribution center in Piazza di Spagna in Rome, okay, even though it would be an optimum, economically looking point of view, a location in order to, to service downtown Baroque Rome. <clears throat> Makes no sense even when we say those words. You know. uh, so the impact on the city, now that's uh, not an easy term. I mean, cost it's easy. easy. You still have to go and talk with a company, talk with a city, have that, and have numbers which are uh, relevant. Uh, time, again, we can measure, and we know we have, uh, the profession has acquired a number of, of uh, uh, tools and experiences on how to measure time. Impact is much more difficult, because it's, it's something which is not we don't have an established methodology and not even everybody agrees on how to measure now. So there are various, I'm not sure I put it in my head, but there are various measures one, or elements one uh, might want to consider. One is certainly uh, the impact on the environment. Now, again, uh, if you talk to people in environmental engineering, uh, they will tell you that to measure the emissions, for example, it's a difficult thing and, and it, but it, it's dependent on many uh, elements. In particular, it, it depends on what vehicles are we exactly talking about, their age, the motorization they have, the, the generational engine they have. The congestion, meaning the speed of the vehicle. Third, the topology of the street, because it's a different dispersion in the atmosphere. If you are, I don't know, like, like the boulevard down in, in the back of the university here, where it's large, not many buildings close to it, and the building is not very high. So, in a sense, you are almost like on a highway where there is a lot of space where whatever you, you put into the atmosphere can go away in a sense. Now, it also depends on how much wind you have, how much you, how much, what is the heat, what is the humidity. But take exactly the same conditions, exactly everything else, and put them, I don't know, in a street, in an oh, like, I'm, I'm, in Rome, for example, where they have those buildings which are 12 floors high, or in New York, where they have those buildings which are 20 or 30 floors high, you are like in a canyon, in a mountain. And then, unless you have a wind which is exactly in the same direction as the street, uh, everything stays there. It's, it takes a while until they can go up and get out of 
people know this if you want. And especially if it's very humid, like it happens all the time in summer in New York, you have kind of a gap and everything stays down. So there are equations that the, the environment engineer and the, and the um, physical engineer, the physical scientist, the, the physicists have um, developed. Very detailed, non-linear, non-continuous, beautiful engineering creation, the systems of non-differentiable partial uh, derivative, uh, you know that. I, that one, one of the reasons I didn't want to engineer is that I didn't like those type of systems, and I knew about them. So we went to them, so it's fine. But they are much too detailed. I mean, they are good if we do a simulation, a micro simulation. So you take a neighborhood and you actually follow the car following individual vehicles, even a bicycle. Following individual bicycles or cars or buses or trams, then you can add characteristics to each of them. If you are into a, a micro zone, you can add characteristics about the city. Now, if you want to do a tactical planning for downtown Milan or downtown Torino, with the, the CDCs located from the outskirts, uh, that's a little bit too difficult. Besides, you have no idea if tactical planning is being done now for what? For something which will be done, executed in two months. It's strategic planning, meaning there is something that will be there for the next five years. We have no idea what the vehicle would be on each street and each day of for the next five years. It's impossible to use those very beautiful designed models, but very detailed models. So the whole idea is to actually develop, with the help of those, uh, to develop more compact approximations. Those can be done through simulation, and I would say that this is a research, a true research part, a uh, research project area by itself, to develop those measures. And then, those are the most difficult. And if you look, there is literature on uh, vehicle routing, on location. We, even I committed a paper with some friends in, in England about the railway and impact on the environment. And a lot of the work that our friends in England have done is to exactly that. What are we putting in? So this is something that I'm just throwing at you like, okay guys, you do a PVC on that. And, I, and then you give me the measures and put them in the model. But you have to be aware of the difficulty, but also the importance of that. And I would say that if you have even a, not a very strong and water, but you have a measure, it could be even statistical in that side. It's, it's important. Because actually what you want is to balance, to balance the actual operation cost, which is really economics, with, with the social element. And that, you know, at one point if you go through, okay, maybe it's worth taking a little bit longer, but to emit less. In the same way, when you actually do an application on a particular city, it's, it's a good idea to actually look at what is the, what what does it mean to to take this street or to to stop and have a, a truck and a truck meet in this piazza. How many people are? Out? It is heavily. Uh, I mean, a lot of working people there. Uh, is it a touristic place? Is this? I mean, is this? Uh, desirable or less desirable. In a sense, nobody wants to see vehicles in their neighborhood. However, they are again, okay. and that you have to do with uh, city authorities in a sense. Okay. So, last but not least, is how do you mix that? If you think about, about it, I'm talking about cost and or profits, time, and in 
these are three criteria. Well, technically, this is multi criteria optimization. Okay, now, multi criteria optimization is a branch of operations research where fundamentally one recognizes that the decisions have to fulfill more than one objective. This is particularly uh, important when we actually uh, have a negotiation or different stakeholders which do not necessarily agree talking together. So, in a sense, the city is such, I say. And then, normally, the, there, is, there is methodology to consider those separately and to find a solution which is not the best for one, but which is the best, how would I say, which cannot be better on all the criteria at the same time. Multi criteria analysis is this means you have two, three, five, ten criteria. When you solve, your optimal solution is not the one which is the best, but which cannot be better on all the criteria. Now, most of the operations research, even when there is more than one criteria, and actually here you have one decision maker, the group of stakeholders with the city who will be deciding, they decide. And in this case, when you have a single decision making maker, those criteria are put together into what is called a generalized system cost. Now, parenthesis, when you do true multi-criteria analysis, one of the ways to address the problem is to build such a multi uh, 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 general uh, objective function, but then each, each element, each of the three elements here, has a weight. And then the analysis is to actually play with the weight. What is more important? The economy is more important, the environment, the time, uh, time and environment twice as much as cost, or the cost have to be important and the other two are okay. So by, by playing with the weights, then you can see what solutions emerge, and there will be more than one which will be impossible to beat on all, but one which will be may maybe more cost uh, conscious, the other one which will be more environment conscious. And that, that forms kind of, kind of, actually forms a, a group of solutions which are better than all the other ones in most criteria, but if you take them one by one, two by two, you cannot say that this one is better than the other one in everything. And that is what is called the Pareto Frontier. Okay. Now, this is in two minutes multi criteria operations research. Now, when you are a single decision maker and you make a generalized system call, if you have a generalized system measure. Now, we say cost almost by, how would I say it? Because we're, by, by usage, by tradition, by, I'm saying that for the last, I don't know how many years, and it can be cost, which means that all the elements have to be priced out. So time, you put a price on time. Environment, you put a price on the environment. Impact on the city, you put a price. Now, you don't pay for the impact you have by changing freight in Piazza di Spagna. Pero, but you pay a political price, you may pay a city price you pay a loss of tourism. So this is, again, part of the evaluation of when we are working with a particular application of a particular city, how, what is this impact, how important it is. And by the way, yes, even if it's not multi criteria analysis per se, you would like, you would want, not only that, want to do sensitivity analysis, one of the models is ready, to evaluate how important the element is. Because maybe even if you jack the price three times, you could not change the solution. Okay. 
So important of that. It, once you start doing the model, you kind of forget it because it's mathematics. X multiplied by C over the set of Gs. Zero. Again, this is important. Okay. So we want to minimize the general and system cost. By the way, if you prefer, you can maximize the benefits for the city, where all costs are negative and the benefits are positive. Um, obviously, you need to do that satisfy demand. Again, we are talking here long term. So long term, it means that I'm making a kind of a forecast of how the demand will be. It can be time dependent or it can be a value, which is an approximate value, which is okay, that, mm, yeah, that should be it for the next five years. Okay? Depending on what model, depending on what data we have, depending on what we can approximate, and then the model of what we do. Now, obviously, you have rules which come from the city. You have rules that come from the coalition, and then you have system attributes, the type of vehicles that we expect, the size of the facility, things like that. And there are, I would say, in this particular case, three. There is one way to do that. It's called location and location size. Now there are several in location. There are several type of models. The ones that are favored for strategic planning in city logistics are fixed cost location. And it can be, and I will walk you on this for the first two, which is location and location, location routing, and location design. Uh, what, if you remember what location means, is that I dis, I'm selecting among a set of potential sites which have their own characteristics and then I'm looking how I will be using them and the allocation, the routing, the service design are ways to actually represent how I will be using the location that I'm selecting. Okay? That's location. Now you can go read the books and come back in one week and answer the exam. Right? Okay, let's go. Right. Okay. Now, single tier location. So, this is my uh, general city, and uh, those are supposed to be customer zones. And uh, if I am actually deciding to put my distribution center there, I will have this is single tier, single CDC. I will have to go with my vehicles to distribute in the city. So the cost or the, the, the global is how much it costs me to put it here, how much it will cost me to actually use it uh, in cost in generalized terms actually. And then for each of the routes here, this is full, this is empty. For each of the routes here, how much it costs me in general terms? Fine. So if I have only one position, I don't need a model. In fact, I don't need a model. I just use the only one. But if I have more, pot if I have more potential places, it is the best. Well, I don't know because if I'm changing the location. Then obviously, not only the location will be different with how much it costs and, and everything, but also how am I serving all that. So I have to take both those aspects. Design and utilization. Now, let me tell you a big secret. Today and tomorrow, we will do only design. Select and use. That's the only model we will do now. We'll see about 10, 12 of them. They are all, but this is all network design type of model. Okay. No, sorry. Yeah. Uh, what is the difference between the blue and the red arrow from the CDC to city customers? Actually, 
because I want to show you. Uh, thank you for the. We didn't repeat that before we started, but thank you for the question. Actually, because I want to show you that even I mean when we do a single tier, if the city has some dimensions, some customers may be far, and actually some of those roads can be long. And then this is one one motivation why we have moved about 30 years ago, 25 years ago, moved towards multiple tier system because some of those can be very, very long. No. And yeah. When you do Siena, yes, some of them are long, but fundamentally, uh, no, in Siena, fundamentally, something like that, I will go outside and enter the city through here because that's a better utilization of the internal network of the city. But, make sense? Okay, thanks. Okay, so. By the way, if you are in a multi-tier system and you want to locate on a single tier, that's exactly the same issue. So now, okay, this is what I say. It's a it's somewhat classical to start with, and is what is called location allocation. What does it mean? Is that I am not, you know, here, here I'm actually showing the route. Okay? Now, in location allocation, let me show it first and then I'm going out. I am not showing the route. Okay. What am I doing is that this is a potential site. Okay? I have one, I have one here, I have one here. These are external points where the demand comes from, or as I told you, these are what is outside the city. And I, I, mod, I put a number of them to capture the flow with the rest of the world. Okay. Like in Monaco, we have one on the east and one on the west. In Torino, we, have it probably, we could have it at least in four places sometimes. Okay. Uh, but then, I'm saying, well, this customer will be serviced by right that. So if I'm serving it from here, it means that I will allocate this customer to be serviced at least partially by this facility here. How? I'm not looking at it. I'm just looking at you answer. And by the way, it could also be serviced from this one with some cost. Now, you may ask, yeah, but if you notice, for example, this cost, unit cost, is lower than this one, why do you put both? Well, because actually the system it's global, it's the cost of each of those locations that I'm selecting plus what it costs me to go from there. So even if this one may be better than this one, globally that one here may, might not be good because everything going that way will be too cost. Or, or its own cost here might be too high. So what terminal will service what customer? will be decided by the model and we don't want to do an a priori elimination of candidates. Okay? So you don't, this is what is called I'm allocating and I can have an allocation in yes, no or half of it there and half of it the other one or one third here and two thirds there. And this is called location, allocation as a type of problem. It's done on a network. And my demand goes from here to here. This is origin destination demand. Okay? So, again, this does work. So, this is what I'm saying. When you are taking this approach, you have to somehow approximate how much it will go. So again, where does it come? Normally it comes from uh, models of the city, where the city is already there. I mean, when we did the work at the time, there were the models of the city of Rome, which was done actually for, what, for people transportation, cars and transit, not for freight. 
but the network was there, so it was not difficult to actually compute paths and see the length and see the time and, up and use uh, logistic values for, for the costs. Um, now, if I'm looking at in the literature, the first paper like, was fundamentally done in 1999. And this, as I mentioned last week, it was the first, uh, at least from as much as I know, the first OR paper in synthesis logistics by Heidi, by Heidi Taniguchi and his younger colleagues and students in Kyoto University and the Institute of Physics. And it was a very interesting and pioneering model and a pity that almost nobody followed that example. And I am saying that every time I'm presenting that part because maybe one of you will pick it up and, and go from there. But actually I just happened to see a paper which is not just well a little bit of that being done. Taniguchi, who proposed one of the initial definitions of city logistics, was saying that he, he imagined and, and, and the city logistics and business environment as a free world, free economy one. So meaning he was before the coalition, these were came after. Uh, we propose a little bit of that idea. But he was he's Japanese. And actually in Japan, uh, the company, like the people, are very much aware of the society needs and they follow the rules. And in particular, with respect to the intelligent transportation system, the Japanese government has a very developed one, but has another one which is in parallel for the motor vehicles for private transportation to guide, to give information, and actually the companies follow. So for, for any it was clear that if you give the right information, the companies will follow the right, the right thing to do, because this is what a Japanese entrepreneur and, and uh, manager would do. Okay. So he, he had this location allocation idea, and to evaluate it, he went to what is called a bi-level uh, um, problem set. What, are, what, what do we mean in, in terms of modeling and problem definition by a level? Is that somebody decides on the environment, if you want, and the rest, the rest of the people or companies make the best decisions from the, for themselves within this environment. So typically, it is applied to people transportation. So the city will set up a bus system. And we say on this line, I will have a frequency of every three minutes. And on this line, every five minutes, or every 10 minutes, or every minute. And then, People will look at how much that takes on time, how much it costs, how much it takes time with the car, and they will make a choice. So the choice of utilization is individual as an answer to what is there. So a bilevel model tries to predict this in order to make the best policy or in this case design decision. So you find in one single mathematical model, on one level you have the uh, location, allocation, and the allocation cost comes from the second level where you have a user optimum of the tra tracking companies making selection. So you have, you have two models, in fact at the time it was not one model, it was really two mathematical models and they were exchanging the information. Very interesting. It was 1999, go back a long time. We know much more now. I mean, if we do the same thing, the model will be stronger, richer, faster. Okay? Maybe, in fact, we write one single formulation. And I still believe that that's a good idea in order to incorporate even how much demand I would have to actually satisfy. Um, but it was a 
the first design uh, model, and as I said, very few people actually found the performance. And I, I saw something this week, and I have to read it yet, but it looks at something. Then we published in 2004 with my two friends and colleagues in La Sapienza uh, this idea of a two tier system where we were locating satellites. Uh, and we built that with administration on our own, assuming that you have entry points at, at all the major gates of Rome, which is the old Roman uh, ways. And then you had, you're looking in the downtown Rome, which is a baroque neighborhood, where fundamentally you have the zone, the control room, the, 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 uh, this is where it was the zone where we actually, so the satellites were to be located around, or within, or around that, that zone. And we had, I don't know, 40, 50, something like that. And, um, it was a very simple location allocation, and to have the, the cost on the allocation, we're using the ILT and need to uh, model that the actual uh, municipality of Rome had at the time. And um, well, it was published. And we did have this undesirability factor on node and size. It was not environmental. We knew about it, but they were. Very little information at the time we took a view. So we used something which was more what is at street, you know, the abandoned of and you can not to put too many parts on the end. And, so, and uh Montecito you were uh, not a good best place to well, unless you want to you don't like the people who are in the government like not to can do study in this. Okay. Uh, but the art costs were actually minimum cost parts on the net. So it was not, mm, this, this is 50 years from the old year. Of the year. Um, so that was. <coughs> so, in all generality, you have an energy destination demand. So from here to here, and also from here to here, so it goes both direction. Um, you have arcs, mm -hmm. and then you have costs which approximate the cost of delivery and pickup, if you do the both of them. And there is, as I told you, there is no difference if you have a single tier system or multi tier system. If you locate on one tier point. I mean, if this is a set, it's a two tier system, it means that that comes from a higher tier. Same. Capacity is certainly at, at both the potential facilities, you could have capacities on arcs as well, particularly when some of the arcs could be public transport of massive flow. Obviously, at that time, we are talking about and maybe na na na. You don't find anything in the model of the 20, beginning of the third millennia. Uh, in the beginning, in the first 10 years, we don't find much uh, public transport of rail into the motor train. And what you get, oh, I wanted to be too smart here. So you have an origin destination at Matrix. I'm trying to keep, I'm trying, not very good at it, but still trying to keep the same notation all over the place. So I have an origin destination matrix for each K, which is a commodity as it's called, from origin to destination. It could also be by product in a sense, if you go to, and uh, our 2004 paper, I don't remember it, has it? The 2009 paper, yes, is also product in there. And then you have to decide for each location, yes or no, I take it. Okay. And then the utilization is how much of that demand will go on each arc. Now, obviously, uh, the arcs will be 
one from the origin of the commodity to a facility, which you have to actually locate, and the other one is from a facility to its destination. So, I mean, I forgot to put some parentheses in here. Uh, and this has to be done for all the potential locations which can be linked to that particular destination or origin. By the way, uh, even if you say I can go to J from my origin, it doesn't mean that from J you can go, well, I mean, you have to go to the destination. But if you are going the other way around, uh, from I to O doesn't mean that you have the same connection in both. I mean, that has to be present what you have in the system. Uh, so this is a model. Now, I have some explanations in a moment. What I want to show you is that fundamentally, again, if it, you can go back to the other file and see the structure of the design model, but it always has the same structure, which is I need to pay to have the network. In location problem, I'm only paying what? Pure location, I'm paying to locate. And I'm paying to locate, this is the fixed cost of having this facility in this property. It can come with different capacities and make them Okay, you have this here. Now, this is the design cost. In this particular case, what you come here is fundamentally the utilization cost. Now, because this is a simple location allocation, what I have is the cost for each, this is each, K is demand. Remember, J is our potential location for the facility. Okay? So I'm looking at the cost to move from a facility to a customer. So I have the cost of moving from facility J to location I of, which is a destination of commodity K. And this is a cost for commodity K, and I let it here, with the quantity of that demand that I'm putting on the top. Okay. Now, I need to keep the K up even if I have it down here, because when I say J I K, that identifies an arc. It's from this place at this place. It's a geographical identification. Now, in all generality, in this R, I can have more than one commodity. Okay, now, when I'm right, putting the model in the computer, I can simplify things, but this is the cost of this commodity on this R, and it's a unit cost. It means that each unit that I'm putting, I'll cost this. This is a fixed cost with a zero one decision variable. So if I don't select, this is zero and I don't pay it. If I select, this is one and I pay the full cost. This is not like, ah, I take it a little bit, I take it, no, no, you take it or you don't take it. That once you took it, how much you are passing through it, that's the utilization and this is continuous. Same thing, this is on the other one from the nodes which are outside to the facilities and this is the arc from the outside to the facility J for K with a quantity that goes in there. Make sense? Now, all the design no model constraints are flow, is flow. So actually flow means that one has to satisfy demand In and the destination, and in between, you don't get, you don't lose. Whatever gets in, gets out. Conservation. Okay. Uh, plus, you have to respect whatever limits exist. So you can, if you 
if the location, the facility has a ma maximum utilization rate, well, you can put more than the capacity. If the arc has a capacity, you cannot put more, you cannot pass more than what the capacity of the arc is. And actually what it goes to the arc is the sum of everything, all the flow, all the demand that may go on that arc. Now, this is flow, minimum cost, right? Flow network flow. But here, when you are in design, some of, the, some of the elements of the problem, you have to select them. They are not necessarily there from the beginning. So if you don't select them, you cannot use them. Which means that even if you have one million tons that you can pass to that facility or that art, if you didn't select it, if you didn't pay for it, you don't have it. So it means that you cannot use it. So that capacity constraint, it's also very much what is called a leaking constraint, which says that if, the, if you didn't select, if the selection is at zero, the flow going through it is zero as well. Okay. So this is what you have here. It means that at every, fundamentally, at every terminal, every location, for every, for every product, every K, what gets in has to get out. You don't create and you don't lose things. But yes. Sorry, but uh, probably I misunderstood. But the second term of the subtraction, you yeah. Mean, yeah. Yeah. Shouldn't it be like a sum of all the possible i from the commodity? No, because the commodity has only one i. Okay, so each uh, each commodity has only one origin and one destination. Yes, this is what they, I mean, okay. Now, origin destination demand matrix means exactly that. that okay. Each element, okay, let me just give you a larger definition. So each element is one commodity from one origin to one destination. Okay? Now, this assumes that everything which moves is more or less the same. So it means that, for example, in our city, in a city logistic environment, I am using the smart containers I talked about last week. Which means that whatever physical product I have, they are all in the same type of boxes and I can put them together. Now, if I also have particular product that I want, I need to differentiate, then in a sense, it means that my origin destination matrix is in fact a cube, which for each product, this is product one, the quantity from this origin to this destination is something. Now, product two, I might also have a quantity from the same origin to the same destination, or maybe not. Okay? So then there is a simple transformation to actually bring it back to this notation. So in fact, this is a general notation, but you might need to do a little bit of work if you really have physical products as well. Okay? So in reality, when we're coding things, we have a label inside to know what kind of product it is. Or you can have it explicitly having KP, for example, to have a joint a joint index, which, one, which I don't really like having two, two letter indexes because it's confusing, but uh, in, you, uh, in a, how do I say? intuitively you can, and actually we have the demand for product P for the K element of the origin destination. Okay. Uh, but no, you're right. I understood. Yeah. No, no, but that was a very good question actually, and I should have. So, um, now this one, uh, this is where I'm varying things to follow up on. 
because here I don't know this I have to have done fundamentally for all of them obviously if I don't use them this will be zero and everything will be fine okay but now what I'm saying is that in order to for my demand I have to pass it to one or several terminal and this is say that at each I mean I have to get out at origin and I have to be to get in at destination this is what I'm calling the fundamental I mean these are okay let's come here it means that for example to have a flow from this on this arc which passes which go to facility J I need to have J paid for so if I didn't select facility J this variable here would be zero which means that a non-negative flow will be less or equal whatever multiplies here is zero it means it would be zero so this is fundamentally the limiting constraint same thing on the other one if I don't have J I cannot go out of J to any destination so for this one it will be zero if this one is not selected now if this one is selected how much I can pass on that arc okay if I can go on an arc <coughs> how much can I put on it well the maximum I can put it when I am alone on the arc and if I am alone on the arc I cannot put more than the demand because I, I, well, that's the maximum I have okay? now if the capacity of the arc is higher than I put my demand if the capacity of the arc is lower than my demand well I cannot go higher than the capacity so in a sense I'm doing OR course in the same time I'm doing CT logistics now if you look at this thing here x it's a continuous variable it's a quantity i think it's written here it's a con it's a quantity of flow that i'm putting on an answer now why it's a zero one so it's either zero or one so i'm comparing a variable which can take I don't know, let's say the maximum demand is 1,000 ton can go from 0 to 1,000 and I compare it to 1 mm, doesn't work like that so in order to be, I have to have more or less the same measure so this is always why I have here a constant so the flow is less or equal a constant which is multiplied by the selection decision make sense? Now, this constant, it can be anything. In all operations research, we have something which is called the big M constant, which means that you put a, 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 a value high enough for that constant to work. Now, you write the model, it's fine, but normally you want to put them into a computer after that. And to put them in the computer, you can put it into one of the software that exists, uh, Cplex, Gorobi, uh, I forgot. Uh, which one, the, the one that you're liking? Yeah, I don't know. I'm using Cplex. You will use Cplex, okay. Uh, there is another one that a lot of people use. You know, doesn't matter, they are many. Those, those two are, you can put it into Excel if you really, if you have something which is more than Fine. Now, those software have algorithms inside. We are in combinatorial optimization mixed integral program. You all know that if I am exclusively into continuous optimization, I do have algorithms which are even for the polynomial, and this is called the simplex. Patterns in the better in 1950 something. George Emerus professor. We all call him Papa Tanzi because actually he created the film. Okay. That's a 
very nice algorithm because it goes continuously on the frontier of the domain. When you go to integral programming or mixed integral programming, the mathematics are not strong enough. In a sense, the only true method, optimal method, is to enumerate. I don't know how much you remember from your OR courses, but when I am in continuous, I mean, I'm walking here so that I can put my feet anywhere I want. It's continuous. Okay? I can stop anywhere. I can take long, short, I can jump, I can make my clown here, no trouble. If it's integer, it means that I have only, from time to time, one of the little tiles, and everything around it does not even exist. I mean, that's very hard to understand. I mean, but when we look at space out there, some, and we look at, 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 at um, planets and suns and all those uh, things, there is something in between. A ship can go. Go, actually, we did so. In mathematics, that's nothing, emptiness. If you didn't have a mathematical map, which is a model, to know what the potential values of the integer variables are, you would not even know that I have a time when I am here and that another time exists there. And there is no continuous way here to make a step. To make a step, I need something to step through. It doesn't exist. So the only thing I can do mathematically is to jump from one pile to the next. I'm, I'm not sure how much you follow me. Uh, you don't, huh? It's very difficult to follow. But let's say that you are, it's an island. A tile is an island. And you don't, I mean, you look, at, you are in the Polynesian island or, you know, in, in Vietnam, in the Hong Kong Hong Bay, they are the beautiful island, uh, South China Sea, it's a beautiful island. But the way you are, you see the sea around you, but you don't see anything else. Robinson Crusoe. Okay? We go back. So I'm on an island. How I arrived there? I turned from a plane. I don't know, maybe uh, it, it was a, that movie with. Uh, um, ah, how was it? Oh, oh, exactly. He, he had a baseball. No, a football or a baseball? Volleyball. Volleyball. Yeah. Volleyball, right, it was a volleyball because of white. Okay. That's a no, no, novel version of Robinson Crusoe. So you are on an island. And you look around and you don't see anything. Where can you go? One, you don't walk on water, do you? Anybody walk on water? Mm. No. Mm. For the last 2000 years, nobody has managed to do that. Uh, and in any way, even if you are working on water, where do you go? There is nothing out there. Aha! But if you have a mathematical map, you know that even if you don't see it, there is an island there. Now, how do you go there? By a mathematical transformation. Somebody picks you up with a helicopter, drops you from the other one. This is what you do. And this is called enumeration. These are combinatorial problems. It means that we know the variables. The integer ones here, they take 0, 1. Now, what is the solution here? It's a value for each location, for each side. It's a 1 or it's a 0. So, a solution, it's a vector, which is as long as the number of potential signs. And for each one, you have a 1 or a 0. So, one solution.
push it, you have only zeros. Another one, is you have all ones. And everything in between. But I know that. And I know how long that vector is. And I know that each entry cannot be other things than zero and one. So I can, because I have my mathematical compass and math, I can say from zero, zero, I have neighbor, which is one, one neighbor, first one is one, everything else is zero. Another neighbor, first one is zero, second one is one, everything else is zero. So I know where they are. Now, in a computer, I can evaluate them. Because if I have zero, zero, I have an easy one. Zero, zero, um, is zero. Then, fine, that was fast. But for every, for every iron, I can evaluate it. Because I say, okay, I know what the y's are. I know how much this is. And if I know what the y's are, what do I get? What is a problem which I have in my hand once I know what the y's are? So forget the y. This is computer. It's a constant. For all the zero y's, this, the x's are out. So the only thing which you are left with are the capacity here for the ones which are 1. So that has to be less or equal to this. And you have drop 6 here. What is that? That's a minimum, mini, minimum cost. In this particular case, uh, drop cost. Actually, quite potential cost. And an offer to solve it. This linear program. We call it secret. So it's zero. Right step. Okay. Now, so, enumeration. It's a hard one what I'm saying here, but it's true. It's the only exact solution method. Now, obviously, this is not what is, what is programmed into your computers. Because it works if I have five violence. But combinatorial optimization means that you have an, an exponentially increasing number of solutions when the problem size increases. If I have only one choice, how many solutions I have? One. Two. Ah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm catching my students every, every time. It's two. I take it or I don't take it. But you're right, I'm sure. Only one to evaluate. Okay? If I have two, I have three, because I can take the first, the second, actually four. Or both of them, or none. If I have three, the first, the second, and third, one and two, one and three, two and three, all the three, or none. Or I'm taking four, we can go down. I mean, until five, how far are we going? Five of them, and we get about, I don't know, 15 stuff in there, we are still. Okay, I can evaluate, and actually it's exactly what Ricardo here will be doing to evaluate a couple of things fast, 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 fast. But on, the, on, on any regular problem, the size of the vector of choice is too large. So fundamentally what we have, and this is what it's implemented, is, how can I say, um, partial enumeration, with cutting off regions where we mathematically know that the solution is not there. And these are called branch and bound, branch and price, branch and cut, branch and cut and price. They are all on the same environment, meaning that I'm implicitly enumerating everything. And, and the whole idea is to try to evaluate as few solutions as I can by deriving bounds and cuts and all kinds of stuff to eliminate large parts of the solution space. Now, and there are many, I mean, the literature on, on, on mixed, on integral programming and mixed integral programming, it's extremely rich. 
and there are some beautiful books out there, including by, by, by Ben Hunter, uh, on, on integral programming. And I put that. Now, and you have a lot of development. Fundamentally, they are all the same. And then you can add things. But then it's still long. For any problem, of, for many problems actually, uh, depending on the type of problem and how many other constraints I have, it still may be too, 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 too long. So then we invented heuristics. And that's an, another huge part <coughs> of the literature on solving. Uh, simple heuristic, uh, complex meta heuristic, math heuristic, or like mixing heuristic thinking and exact part of the solution. Because trying the whole idea is to say I cannot explore everything, not even implicitly. Can I explore regions where I believe that things could be good? How do I believe that the whole range of methods from tattoo search to to monkey algorithm to this one doesn't exist, but mm -hmm. the bees exist and the hound exists and uh, well, we always said that we will do a monkey uh, here. Uh, in fact there are some very nice uh, surveys from location routing, including a couple of Proudhon and uh, Prince, which have most of it on a single field. They only touch on the idea of predicting. Now, I put it those two. This was the first one, 2012. So I told you the first 10 years, not much. Okay? The first one, 2012, and these are French guys uh, now to this place, this part. I want a number of friends in there as well. And they had uh, the first model. And but it was, in a sense, single tier, single fleet, only in bound demand. But they did take into account the environment and social impact, the general aspect that we were talking about in the beginning. Okay. Uh, so that's, I think they were, oh, I don't remember the solution. Oh, I think they tried a little bit of exactly the term. Now, this one, Janesi, Janesi, I'm sorry, uh, at all, but it, it's something that I like. Now, Janesi was a PhD student at a French university in Paris, I don't remember the, the number, uh, with uh, Professor Roberto Calvo, which happens to be Italian, like, like Janesi, but they were both Italian, but Professor Roberto Calvo is Professor in, in France, in Paris, for now I don't know, 20 years ago. He's also a little bit professor in, in Cagliari, but okay, that's, that's university politics. Uh, they were participating to a European project, and they had some partners like everybody. Now, they proposed in this project a very interesting concept, which it's somewhere in between one tier and two tiers. You know, they were two tiers, but they didn't call it this way. What they said is that they do have, they were talking like gates and facilities, so they, they use their own vocabulary, which is not always easy to understand, to, to follow, especially because they were the, the only ones who used that one. But they had a very interesting uh, idea, and actually, not only the heading, but they put it into writing and they wrote the model with that. And maybe you notice that I mentioned sometimes when I look at my ideal city around city that, oh, I will not go through it, I will go around it. This is the whole idea that you do have normally a ring road. Or you can build one, or what they said that actually you can build a tram line around the city. Now, that was partially uh, motivated or in fact uh, initiated from the fact that the tram in Paris doesn't go in the middle of the city, it's around the Boulevard de Maréchaux. I don't know 
if, you, if, if you've been to Paris yet, if not, I hope you go. Uh, but Paris, in a sense, it's really around the city. And there were the, the old uh, walls, which are no longer there for many, 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 many years. And this is where they have a ring road of boulevard. And, and each boulevard has a name of a... Of a Field Marshal of the Napoleonic Army, and this is called the Boulevard des Maréchaux. So this is how they were named, and this is also where they have the, the actually the periphery, which is the, the ring of highways, which is really around the, the inner city of Paris, and it reproduces the medieval uh, uh, difference between the inner city and the outer. And the tram is about two thirds on Boulevard de Marshal. It's not closed yet. But they imagine that that exists, or if not, it exists something on the street, where you can have actually a public or a massive flow, if you want, means of transportation on the ring road. Could be a tram, it could be a larger truck. It all depends, actually, from a city. Logistic point of view, better to have a, uh, uh, have a tram, but anyway. So the idea was that you get into, you get into the urban region through those gateways, which in my, uh, in a sense, are CDCs, and then you move around the city, and then you go to do the routing inside the city. Okay. So they presented the, the model, uh, the program, in the paper which is here, uh, they, they discuss the setting very briefly in a sense, and then there is heavily algorithm, algorithm development, but they do have the model in there, which is an interesting, an interesting model. So I think, so I'm, I'm talking about that, not because actually their project materializes, it didn't, but there is this idea that uh, you try to avoid as much as possible the sensitive part of the city. And in particular, uh, we can move around. Now, I'm introducing, and you saw that, those points outside of the city, also because to say, well, if you are there, you are not necessarily obliged to go to the closest facility and then move around the city. You could actually maybe take the the network of highways outside the city to go to another one. And if you need to move around, then you move around. It's a question of actually trying to have the best distribution of, um, of traffic around the city. Now, Boccia was a student at the time uh, and uh, in from uh, Federico Duri in Napoli. And actually the professor was Antonio Sforza and Antonio now has retired, and we have Claudio Ester, who was a young professor at the time. I'm not sure if he's not in Aguilar yet, but he should be soon if he's not already in. Um, and that was a, a very much Antonio's idea. And this is a very interesting idea, which they had previously on a, on a different problem, but it's a follow -up. The city exists, right? Flows are there. So, I mean, we have things being distributed and we can look on the other side as well, on the other direction. They didn't, but at the time, that go inside. So, all those enterprises who are managing those flows, who are bringing things into the city, maybe they are not using the satellites in the city, but they know the city. Think of now. You better know the city before you start driving in there, right? Good. So they know the city. So why not actually try to capture and to build on their knowledge? Saying it's maybe at least even the driver will know that. So the idea is what is called flow interception. So for example, you can look, these are the outside origin and these are the destinations in the city. Good. 
Now you can make, because they are regular inquiries, what are the flows, what are the paths that most of the uh, enterprises who move from between the points here follow. And in, in a sense, we find out when we do that, that even if the decisions are made independently, when you look at the map of the city, there are corridors. I mean, even for people, there are corridors. Because the streets are larger, maybe the, 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 the traffic lights are organized, synchronized, whatever they are. Maybe there is a difference at one point for people and for freight. It all depends on the city. But then you can find those paths. So then the question is, why not? If they use them, they are not totally bad. And if you, even if you disregard completely and you try to, to move around, well, you might end up in there. There is already some regulation, even if the people don't follow it mostly. But at one point, if you cannot pass in from I don't know, the cathedral, well, you, there would be no path in there. Okay? So why not try to put the satellite in such a way that you capture those flows. But in a sense, you, 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 the locations, the, 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 the evaluation of, of how good the location, how bad the locations are, is being done by how much freight will be captured with the current condition, not changing anything. Else. So the only thing that you do you want to capture the flow, for example, coming in, and then to go outside. And you don't change anything as a city, right? The only thing what you do is locating, locating for um, facilities. Now, where you locate them, and that it all depends on how you want to balance things. So, for example, if you decide to locate early on, okay, it's fundamentally the cost from outside to the facility will be low, but most of the cost will be here. So the routing part will be most, most important. Now, if you, if you look at them, and they will not capture much. Each of them will capture only part of it. So they will capture in little flow, but little flow, and very locate, as a constrained flow. If you put them closer to the downtown, to the control area, to Centro, you will need fewer facilities. And then you balance more or less the routing goes with the movement here. You have more movement there. Now, which approach is better? There is no absolute answer to start with. It very much depends what city are we talking about. Where are those locations? Do they exist? Can I actually have something in there? So each, once you go from the model to the actual application, will be a different one. In the paper, there is an application of the network. And uh, so very much, it, it's moving the, how would I say? Instead of saying, okay, I'm trying to predict what the demand will be in order to evaluate my decision now, this year. I'm saying, since I don't plan to change right now anything else in the system, why not look at what I'm doing now? Because I have to be good with what I'm doing now as well. Because if I'm contracting, I'm changing, I'm saying, you have to walk to that facility it means that I'm changing the usage now. And if it's bad, how can I convince the, the partners, the, the stakeholders, that it's good when it will be a bad solution given the current thing? Unless, of course, you say, well, the municipality or whoever, they don't want to have things here. Okay. But then you can always ask, if you cannot go through that part, where will you go? So it's, it's moving the proof of the utilization for the 
from the long-term prediction, which is uncertain very much, to something which is more safe, which is what we have here. So it's a bit, very interesting approach that you can combine into everything there. You still have location and routing, of course, but you, you work on the, on the path to jump. Now, this is everything up to now was fundamentally on a year of cake on a single day. When I'm going to multi tier systems, is that normally I'm trying to design or to redesign more or less a system completely. So the CDC is under that. Now you tell me, obviously, you don't do that every year, obviously not. Uh, the CDC, the city distribution centers, those are facilities which are, in a sense, heavier, larger, more important. It's true that very few cases have seen new facilities being built. All the cities, especially the major ones, have already a lot of facilities around that you can rent medium to long term. So in that case, you could change. Either you change where you rent, or at least for how much space you rent. Because again, you are not obliged to take it all. So it's still strategic in a sense, because you say you want to change the demand patterns have changed, for example. So you need to change the structure of your supply network. And when you go to several tiers, maybe you don't change the main CDC, but you may change the two, level, two tiers of satellites, for example, the major and the, and the secondary one, which are very close to the neighbor. So we can and, and want and may want and do want sometimes to locate on several tiers in a simultaneous way. Okay. Now, as mathematics go, as operations research go, that nothing changed. I mean, we have more decision variables, we have more integral variables, we have more uh, uh, combinatorics here, more linking constraints. Think about that. If I have a CDC and a satellite, and I need to move, well, in order to move, the CDC has to be open, the satellite has to be open. That means that I have linking constraints on both sides. Yes, model is bigger, but it's still the same thing. Okay. Now, how can I go? Well, the easiest way is still to go to location allocation. Meaning, forget how I move, I'm just linking, and I put an approximation to the code. So exactly the same type of thing that I have on the single tier. Right? I was connecting, I only have direct links connecting the layers of facility and the other facilities to the customer. With the usual preoccupation about how am I computing that. Um, what you get fundamentally, and there are applications in there and supply chain, uh, you have a very poor network flow problem as a software. Then is to go to, go to multi tier location or multi tier location and design. Not yet done. I know a young lady who is supposed to do it, so I will not talk about it today. She will talk about it later on in the coming years. But I will talk a little bit about that thing here. So, again, Going back, back to the same Napolitan team, and I was working a little bit with them, but uh, they were the movers. Um, we started trying to do locating on several, on two tiers. And we developed the modeling, and actually I, I put it in because it illustrates both the complexity 
and, and the potentiality, and it allows me to talk a little bit about routing in respect to location. So again, was well, simple, simple. One commodity with the way that we talked earlier on, meaning everything in the same boxes, only inbound flow, one fleet per tier, uh, no synchronization, no time, nothing. That will come later. And we did three formulations here. Fundamentally, to kind of reproduce the main three formulations for routing. Okay. I will show you the diagram. I will not show you the model. Because it takes me about three pages each. If anybody is interested, the document exists. It's a, it's a serial report, not difficult to get. Or I can send you, just send me an email and send you the, the document. Okay. Um, now, it's, it's modeling and fundamentally after the paper that followed by people work on metaheuristics, matrix. Okay, now, three index, three index, two index, one index. The name comes, as I told you, from the formulation of the routing problem. Even the very simple routing problem, one people, customers, and I'm building tools out of the Everybody has seen what a routing is? Yes, no? Should I take 10 minutes and tell you a little bit about what a routing is? Maybe yes. Maybe yes? Okay. Okay, oh, yeah. let's do that. Maybe it's not a bad idea to do it. Okay. A little bit of routing. Uh, <coughs> vehicle routing is a very important component of operations research and transportation. Uh, I don't know, there are thousands of papers out there. I think that at one point somebody counted like 10,000 and growing. I, at one point, um, we are about, I don't know, 30 something who are professors in Montreal, 30, 30 and 40, I don't even remember. Uh, about half of them, at least half of them, maybe more, have some routing interest. Some of them are only routing. For about 25 years, I said that I will never do routing because there are so many of my colleagues in the, on, you know, na neighbors of mine that I will never buy another one. Why? The city of GC obliged me to go to routing, so I'm now one of the crowd doing routing as well. It's very important. Very important um, for several reasons. One, it has been developed with uh, distribution in the city, and uh, that's an important logistics aspect. So, yeah, many, many people do that. Um, it's also a, a fundamental combinatorial accumulation problem. So there have been a lot of methodological developments, including for metaheuristics. So a lot of the genetics, taboo, BNS, uh, and others have been done on on, uh, on, on Okay. Now, as part of uh, city logistics, or as freight transportation in the city in general, Routing is the last and first 
kilometer, miles. In America, we say miles, in Europe, we say kilometer. Sometimes I'm saying the last 500 meters if it's done by bicycles or by, by walking. Um, and the whole idea is that a vehicle or some more than one vehicle moves the freight from one location and moves it to the customer who are waiting for it. And to do that, that performs a tour in the city. So the routing is to build those tours. Okay. Now they are, I'm not exaggerating when I say a huge, I will shoot to you about a dozen names at one point, but there are more than that. Violence. And then all kinds of value depending on the vehicle, on the demand, on the time, stochastic. Name. There are books, complete books on your routing. And actually, if it's routing on nodes or routing on apps, there are different books. Fine. Let's go. So, basics. This is a basic setting of routing. I have one location, which I know where it is. It's normally node zero. If you go to the notation, which is, which is a classical vehicle routing notation, is a depot where the vehicles are and the, and the depot where the freight is. All in one location. I mean, this is a basic fundamental problem set. It goes down, down, but to dancing and as the name of the second author, 1956 or 58. The same dancing actually who invented the simplex method. That's why Papa Dancing invented also uh, uncertainty in a while, a lot of things. Okay. Now, these are customers who, who require to be serviced and some afraid to be. So each, so each customer has a certain volume that needs to be brought from this location. How? Well, there are some vehicles. Actually, I'm, I'm putting a more complexity than the basic, 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 because I have even two types, two fits. Normally, you have only one. The basic combination is only one. And the vehicles generally have capacity. Okay. A big one is more, just to make it. Okay, so I'm building a tour, meaning that I'm starting from there and I'm visiting a number of them. How, in what order, we'll talk about that in a moment. So, this is a tour. So, I'm actually, now of course, because I'm going to see those four five customers. I'm not going just to take a coffee with them. I'm actually going to deliver what they asked for. So the total stuff that I'm putting here has to be to be to, to be able to be put loaded into the vehicle. That's loading that we will talk about. So I'm doing that one tour, this is the second one, and again, even, even if it's the same fit all over, whatever I'm putting into a tour here has to be able to be loaded into the vehicle. And these are the two other two. Now, I might also have a limited fleet here. Okay, I'm, I'm complicating a little bit the, 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 the problem. Now, if you have questions, you send them to Professor. So, I'm actually using the resources that I have. Now, is this solution good? I have no idea. I have no idea how much it costs. I didn't compute anything, I just put it by hand. Now, it's a little bit strange here. If you look at it, I'm actually going out of my way and turning and I'm 
So you may say, well, I'm certain that if I'm computing the distance, this is not good. I totally agree with you. But has been done on purpose. Because actually what I didn't show is that, for example, each customer has a certain time interval when I can go and deliver. And normally, if I'm arriving before, I can wait at the gate. In many settings, not really in city logistics, because we don't really want to, to have a truck parked in Piazza Castello for half an hour. But I cannot open my truck and start delivering before I'm getting into the right interval. So it means that I might very well need here to go in that sequence, which is not the shortest one, but it's the only one, or one of the only ones, that sequence, sequences the visit in an hour. This is a variant, it's not a basic one, by the way. It's a variant where I'm having intervals of time where I can do the delivery. It's called the vector routing problem with time windows. Now, those time windows exist, and even in big shopping malls, for example, uh, Walmart in North America, which is one of the most important uh, distributors retail sellers, they are normally in big shopping malls with parking and but they give their suppliers a 15 minute time window, not more. And if you don't deliver in 15 minutes, you cannot deliver. So you have to come back later and you have to pay a penalty because you didn't deliver on time. So let me tell you that the guys who are delivering to Walmart, they have very sharp, actually, they don't have good software, but their trucks are waiting in the parking of the shopping mall to be able to get at the appropriate time. Okay. So this is routing distribution from a single source. So routing means that I have to, to actually build those tools. Now, how do I build them? If, if you look at the problem, I have no idea I can tell you. That's supposed to work by itself. But if you look at it, somehow I divided, and this was my own purpose, I divided the customers into groups. Clusters, this is, a, this is a scientific name. And then I made a tour for each of them. Okay. So, if you look at a classical vehicle routing problem, you have a network. You have nodes and you have arcs linking those nodes. Now, the arc link going from node A to node B represents the possibility to actually move on the real network of the city or of the region or whatever else from between those two points. But it's represented by a single bar. You have a fleet or more than one, here I have that, with capacitated vehicles. So if all the vehicles have the same capacity and the same, it's called a homogeneous fleet. Otherwise, we talk about the heterogeneous vehicle routing problem. Meaning that they have vehicles which have different characteristics. So you have a multi, multiple three cases there. The, each route has to start and end at the depot. Each customer is visited exactly once in the, in the basic problem, which means that you do not split the demand. There is a branch of vehicle routing where you are allowed to split. Let's forget that one. The total demand, as all, all the customers are assigned to a route, their total demand has to be less than the capacity of the vehicle. You normally have also a total duration. Now, again, this is not a basic problem, but it's <coughs> to 
Historically speaking, it was not there from the beginning, if I have seen. But this is what is a CPRP problem currently. Um, and so you have a maximum duration for all the routes, and you want to minimize the total cost. That's a basic law. Simple, right? Why? It's combinatorial. You can combine those customers, group them, and combine them. Even you must you have to order them. Not only combine them, but order them. Two levels of combinatorial, combinatorial complexity here. We love combinatorial. And we say if you didn't have any hard problems, we won't be here. You know, so this is you put it simple, you put it into simplex. You won't have a PhD and I will be here. So viva la computation. <laughs> So what is a feasible solution that do, does? Boom, 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 boom. It divides, it separates, it partitions the customers. In what will be routes. So you have the partition, you have the cluster, and then you have to sequence them. Or simply sequence them by cost, by distance, and if you have time, you know, also by oh, yes. Now, for each cluster, that sequencing is what is called a tour. Now, there is in combinatorial optimization the basic problem which says I have my customer, my point, and I want a single tour going through all the nodes. This is called the Hamiltonian path. And finding the shortest Hamiltonian path is called the traveling salesman problem. Now, I, I still keep that, I, I think I keep it for the last, I don't know, 20 years or something. I, I love that traveling salesman, you know, with a blue jacket and everything. Uh, the fact is that traveling salesman. Uh, well, in history, you can go, you had a lot of people moving from one village to the other, selling all kinds of stuff. Even if you like uh, opera and you like the Mitzetti, there you, you find a traveling salesman in there. Okay, you have to find the name of the opera for the final exam. That would be one of the questions, actually. Where do you find traveling salesman in Italian? Uh, actually, there is more than one. And uh, in particular, they were very, very uh, active after the Second World War, especially in America, and uh, Miller wrote uh, the test of the traveling salesman, which is a very famous theater piece. Anyway, so the, the problem is very simple. We have those nodes, and uh, you have to find a tour, which is a minimum net. And the classical example of the time was the, the capital state of the continental state of the United States. And for a long time, it was an open problem. What is the best tour? Because that problem started 50 years ago. So, now, if you think about it, then you try to find the tour. I mean, when you look at the tour, you get inside each node once, and you get out once. So if you want to have a tour where each customer node is visited once only, you have to have that. Otherwise, it's not a tour, right? So, this is a basic condition. And the classical decision variable is, uh, do I go to this node after this one? So for each, remember, this is based on a graph, on a network, where all the nodes are connected. Unless you cannot absolutely not go from one node to the other, there is none. But if the arc is there, means I'm linking I to the I on J. Okay? 
and then now that because the arc exists, it doesn't mean that even if i and j are on the same tour, that I'm going to j after i. I have the possibility of doing. So what am I doing? I'm selecting open parentheses. I'm designing the network. Close parentheses. We can back to network design tomorrow. So the basic decision variable in Hamiltonian tools is to J after I. Yes or no? Okay. So this means that my model will be integer programming because actually my only decisions are all integer. The locations that we've seen before the coffee break was mixed integer program because I had the decision to locate yes, no, integer and the decision to assign which were continuous so it's mixed integer program it's a part of integer program if you take a book of integer programming by the one by, by the other you will find it one point it starts talking about both. <coughs> This is the basic model. <coughs> Intuitive. That's the intuition. We are solving programs, so we have an intuition. So if I have to get in, get out, what are my constraints? Well, I have to get in, one, I have to get out, enter each node at exactly one of all the possibilities to select one. To get out of all the possibilities to get out, meaning moving somewhere else, I have to select one. And I have to select the, the axis here. Mm. Okay, let me make it easy. Okay, okay. So this is minimize the total distance, getting in. Once for every node, getting out once for every node. Zero one decision. Trivial, right? Yes. Correct? No. No trivial. Okay. Let me take it. It's much nicer than the American capitals. Unless you talk about, uh, well, even California is if you go to California, go to Malibu, no, 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 Minimize the total cost. That's that is an optimal solution of the model you have on the previous page. But it's not a tool. Because you never ever said to anybody that you want a tool. Because actually getting through the door, through each door, getting in once, getting out once. You can just go to each door separately. No, nothing tells you that this has to be a tour. Now the problem we have, again, the mathematicians didn't do, that, didn't do their work. We don't have the mathematics to be able to write simply, directly, straightforwardly, I want a tour. I can say it, but I don't have any mathematical way to write it. What I can say, this is not a tour and I don't want you. And I can do that for all the solutions like that, which are not a tour. Huh. Mathematics. How? So I have to eliminate what is called the soup tour. 
where I have parts of my node being linked together. And there are many ways to do that. This is one which goes back to now, those three names up there are more or less the Pantheon and some, not, I mean, there are some others, but they are within the 10, 12 people who created war. Dancing, linear programming, we talked about routing, the first paper, talk about introducing uncertainty into that. Fulkerson flows, the basic Bible, I mean, I mean the Let's forget the religion for a moment. But the basic book, the initial book, is for the Fulkerson Network Flows, 61. And Johnson is the guy who actually invented one that formalized complexity. And we still refer to him for a number of proofs that those problems are empty hard. I don't know about you, but I will tell you a secret. I don't remember how to prove that something is empty. I did it long time ago, but I don't remember. It's important to know, but then you can forget it. Anyway, unless you do mathematics. So, what is that? In that if you look, oh, for example, the idea is that we, for all the, if you separate your nodes into two sets, all the possible ways of separating. Many, few, few, anyone. Anyway, each node has to be in one of those two. Well, you have to have a way to go from one to the other. So if you don't, if you eliminate. So you have to select a node for each potential sub tour, you have to eliminate. So this is one of the courses. Integral program. I told you I cannot jump to the other one. I only can enumerate them. Essentially here. I cannot say I want a tour. I can, I, I can say I don't want all those not single tour tours. Now you realize that you have a so not only this problem is combinatorial because the solution is a combination of elements, it's also combinatorial in the uh, of this is why very few so we need a very special formulation in order to get to an exact solution. Okay. So in a sense, each tool is a in such a now, a lot of, and I put in that, and I will go very far, how do you define a routing problem? You have a lot of elements to actually specify. How do you represent the region? So as I told you, there is a route, routing on edges, and this is called the Chinese postman problem. But by the way, the Chinese was not a postman, it was a Chinese researcher who invented the problem for the first time, saying, the postman in a village in rural China, rural postman, has to walk from one house to the other. Now, in the West, we were thinking that somebody, and we didn't know who, invented that problem, but actually it is a true, real one Chinese scientist. He is a dyer now, but at one point, uh, what was an epoch when Chinese people Scientists could move freely out of the country. He came to a number of conferences and it was very touching to, to meet him. Um, then you have to, how many depots? Do you have one or do you have several? Where they are, capacity do you have? You can have family or even on the depot. Then you start working and come on. Normally, when I'm able to manipulate from here, it's easier. So, how many uh, how many fleets do you have? How much do you have the uh, the, the demand? Do you have commodities in there? Uh, the vehicles do they have compartments? Okay. You, each vehicle normally has a cost. 
which is the cost to actually put the vehicle into operation. And then on the arc you have a cost which is associated operating on the arc. Can be associated, or maybe I talk about later, associated to the arc, maybe up to the vehicle, maybe to the demand. Um, anything else? Yeah, but that demand can be on node, and then what do I do? I pick up, I deliver, or both. So this is pick up or delivery, it's vehicle routing. This is called pick up and delivery. So you do, you may do both type of operation in each node, and then obviously at each node, each customer has the time of service, the time window of service, and you have both. Now the time restrictions, I already told you a little bit about the time window, because are, you find them very, 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 very much. Those get very complicated enough at some point. Uh, you must arrive within, uh, you cannot arrive later, but in actual application, <coughs> you have a time window, and then you have the time window of still working by paying penalties. And you have hard time window and soft time window. I can, I can pay a penalty in the other account, so it's much more even complicated than what I have here. But the time windows are very much very important. Uh, and the cost of benefits of product, one or more, limits of length and duration. What objectives? This is the basic one, total cost. Now, total cost, and you just look at the cost of, uh, of optimization. If you also have the cost of the vehicle, as I said before, then clearly you will try to minimize the number of vehicles as well. At least implicitly, even if you don't have it in the cost. Now, you'll see that tomorrow when we go to services, after the the fixed cost on activation of the service. Now, do you have, there is a difference of tours and routes. And I'm trying to mix you up as much as I can. Up to now, I more or less talked about tours, routes, as, as equivalent terms. Okay. Now, a tour is literally a, a closed cycle. From a point, going through a number of points, it's a closed cycle in graph terms. A route, or what we'll be calling later on a workday, is what a vehicle does. Now, in 90% of the papers out there, a route and a tool is the same thing. But you can do actually several tours in the same day if the tools are short. Or sufficiently short. Okay. So you can have multi tour. Do we have any time dependence? Is it a multi period or a single period? We'll, you'll see a couple of those things, especially in practical terms. We talk about splitting demand. But customers of the entire street. We'll keep on, on this uh, answer. Uh, what it means known? When we say that we know, it means that we have a prediction. Otherwise, what we are economists are trying to do the route for yesterday. If I'm trying to do the route for today, later in the day or tomorrow, I'm working on a prediction. Unless I have signed contracts, you know, somewhere to say that this is what I have to do, assuming that what I'm getting there is exactly what I found. Okay. So, no means that I have a good prediction of confidence. Uncertain means that I have a, mm, I have a distribution instead of having no. Dynamic reveal means that I don't know what I will find until I'm getting there. 
and this one, especially for pickup in hand, pickup seat. So the number of classes, classical, traveling salesman, now obviously TSP is driving sales. Man, sales person, it all depends how much you are into equity, inclusion, variability, whatever you are, call it whatever you want. The P is for profit. <laughs> um, CBRP, which is uh, capacitated vehicle routing problem, and this is a very important one. I'm putting route lines, it's funny how the names are because the basic one is CPRP, the BRP has route, route limitation as well but this is how the field developed, you will not change 50 years of vehicle routing, not now. Okay. Um, DRP, TW, this is routing and actually it's CBRP, TW for, to, let them more, to be more precise, we have time in those. The multiple depots, multiple periods, mean that uh, actually I can deliver from several ones. Now, let me stop one minute here. <coughs> the basic multiple depot routing problem, as you find in the literature, has the same product everywhere. It's like gelato by drop. It more should be the same. So, I can deliver from here or from here, it will be the same process. Now, as we go to city logistics, and that will be one of the major differences, the demand has an origin at the destination. So, it will be multi depot, the CDC, the satellite, whatever you like, and it will be multi commodity, which makes a, a huge difference with most of the literature. Multiple period is different from time dependent, and that also is important. Multiple period means that I, I have the same customer has to be served more than once during a certain period of time. And I can serve this, for example, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Monday, Thursday, Saturday, or Tuesday and Thursday. And either most of the problem, I select one of those patterns, or in a few, very few papers, I'm actually designing the patterns okay. outside. And of course, the cutest one is to have both of them. Multiple people, multiple periods. Now, time dependent routing, and you don't see much until city logistics, you are not seeing much in the literature. And when the demand has a timestamp, when it arrives in the system and has a due date, and then the routes will have a timestamp when they start. When they start. Okay? We'll, we'll see more about that. Maybe a little bit today, and quite a lot. Arc routing, location routing, what are doing now? Inventory routing, now it's actually, I'm doing routing also because, and as the customers, not only they have a demand, but actually I have to keep up a level of inventory. There are some very beautiful papers actually by colleagues from Brescia and that area, from Maria Grazia Speranza, Claudia Archetti with colleagues from the state, not in South, but in particular. If you want to, if you are interested, you should go to those papers. And a lot of what we are calling the rich settings, that was invented about what, 50, 15 years ago, terminology rich VIP, uh, meaning that you have more than one attribute in those problems. And fundamentally, city logistics, you are in the rich country. Rich meaning a lot of trouble for you there. Um, and again, we have that. Allocation or partitioning, if you want, clustering, 
explaining what term to prefer, and then sequencing. You can do sequencing first, partition after, but you have to do both. Okay, let me go back to the indexes on the other side. So bear with me, I'm trying to switch presentations here. <coughs> Sorry, before you change your presentation, can I ask one thing about uh, uh, summation when you divide it into two subsets, V and Q? Oh, well, the summation, oh, and that one, but okay, the summation was uh, actually the, what the constraint says that you have a set of partition. So each element in the set has two subsets of nodes, okay? So you partition all your nodes into two subsets, okay? And you have a finite number of nodes, so there is a finite number of combinations on the node which goes in one set and the other node in the other set, okay? So let's say that put node one, two, three, you know, set of four, five, six, seven in the other. And I have all of those. So now, if I'm looking at all those x i j equal one, if I'm going on that, it means that on all of the connections between the nodes in this set and this set, so I'm looking only on. I'm not looking if I have one two three here. I'm not looking the connection from one to two, from one to three, from two to three. I'm looking from one to four, one to five, one to six. To all those inter group links, I make an I make a sum there, I have to have at least one. So the sum has to be. Why? It means that those two groups cannot be separated. So I'm, so I'm, for, I'm forbidding by this the existence of those two sets separate in the final solution. What I didn't understand was why don't you also add uh, the summation? One is summation from B to Q, and also add the summation from Q to B to ensure that it is it be the other way. Because actually, if you take all the partitions, at one point you have that node in the first and that node in the other one. I mean, you can switch. Okay, so you say for all partitions, so that includes B equal to Q minus the yeah. Okay, now I got it. Thanks. Okay. Good question. You had me a lot, actually. I should put a star on your final exam. Uh, okay, so I'm going. Uh, so fundamentally, and you'll see a little examples in the next one, that the two index is only is RTC in or not. And it kind of is one of the initial ones. Uh, the three index is this vehicle on the upper one. So I'm actually, especially when I have a fixed cost on the vehicle, is this vehicle. Because if I don't have a fixed cost, the first of the second or the first, who cares? But if I have a cost, I want to count that. And then the, the single index, I will pay the dollar in a moment. That's the single, the only one in an exact formulation which works. The other one are historical. Okay. So let's go with the most complex because in city logistics we normally have big stuff. Okay? So bear with me, that you're supposed to be able to be managed. If you still don't want to work, no. So I have to do it by hand. Okay. You know what? Okay, let's talk about it. This is my my system, okay? 
So this is a very the simplest system. system what I don't have, I could have those extra nodes here to have from where they come, but I didn't put them in here. By the way, these are this and the next one are directly out of the our reporting is here a very long time ago. Uh, it was uh, the thesis of Claudius, I remember correctly. So these are the main uh, platform, the CDCs as we call them. These are the satellites, secondary platform. This is the first tier or the first echelon. This is the second one. Okay, now one, pro one product, typical routing. So these are the, the customers and they have the demand here. Okay. And I, I need to move them from the platform which I'm here. So what are the problem characteristics? Each platform has a cost. You want it, you have to pay. You pay it, you have a certain kind. It's not infinite. Same thing here on the second tier. You want it, you have to pay. And if you pay, you have a certain amount. Now, on the first tier, you have some vehicles which have a limited capacity. This is homogeneous space on each tier. Okay? Now, so I have the links. Now, and actually the tour has been already revealed just to show it. But each link has a time for this type of vehicles. And uh, so it has the capacity here, it has the cost. And by the way, this is not my family and, and next first name, but it's just cloudy or something like that. And, uh, and you have the routing cost of the vehicle on each link, and you have the time. And this is if you move anything here. Same thing on the second. You have a, a, a capacity, you have a time, you have a routing cost, you have an empty cost. And by the way, of course, if you want to have this, you have to pay, you have a decision variable here, and you have a decision variable here. So what do you have here? I want to know if the vehicle goes on this side. That, so if you look at the and the cost here is of this vehicle on this arc. So the decision vehicle is, is this vehicle going from this node to this node? And in fact, on the first tier, the only thing which we get is either from the platform to the satellite or in between two satellites. It's here. Obviously, that says as well that I have a decision by if I'm using the vehicle. So you have all the usual constraints on the first tier, including you cannot operate it if you are not selected, and you have it the same thing down here. And it, uh, so you have all. So if you look in here, you have the the location variable. That is the most complete model you can have. Do I select the facility, top facility, yes or not? Am I using this particular vehicle, meaning do I pay the fixed cost for this particular vehicle? It's not needed, but it's easier to write, to write on it. You don't need it when you call it. Then, it's how much I'm putting on it. And this is a routing. Is the vehicle, this particular vehicle, going on this particular route? And this is how much flow goes on the limit from, from this particular, well, non total, from this particular platform to this particular satellite. Because what am I bringing to the satellite will be there to distribute to the customer. So I have the same thing on the second. Do I locate the satellite here? Do I allocate customer to satellite? Do I use this particular vehicle? And how do I route the vehicle? So is this vehicle moving on this arm 
follow this up, follow this up. Now, of course, you have the software elimination everywhere, demand satisfaction here. You have, you have to be careful about the capacity here, the capacity here, the capacity of the vehicle. You have linking constraints between selecting the vehicle and using it. Be very big. Unless you have a trivial problem, it's unsolvable right now. It's complete, it's cute, scientifically satisfying, useless. What's not useless in terms of understanding? Because actually, when you start working on the heuristic side of Android, actually, all the variables give you all what relations I have to care about. And then I'm decomposing them. It's a beautiful field. But if you want to solve it exactly, this is not the way to do. Uh, some, something a little bit better is actually to go to a two index where fundamentally you are defining more variables, saying this demand to this satellite, this satellite to this platform, this vehicle to this. So you do it two by two. So you have more assignment variables in a sense, and you build the indirect assignment so through a, a, a chain, I guess. But you have less complicated relation, and it may make you something which is more usable. You have a little chance to go before, beyond a little toy example. Now, in the vehicle routing literature, and known for what? 40 years now, 35 years now, something like that. There is no way to solve exactly vehicle routing problems written in two or three index. R based model. Both two indexes and three indexes are based directly on arcs. Okay? Because it's so huge, even with parallel computing, with that option, parallel computing, distribution, splitting it any way you want, for as long as we want to keep to exact solution methods, I'm not talking about math and metaphysics here, but even with parallel computing, convention bound, convention Branch and bound and branch and cut, not nice. Uh, no. So, what we can do and what is being done. Oh, no. I didn't put it here, I put it in the other one. It's actually single index combination. What is that? Sounds magical. Harry Potter. I want to call myself one of these and one of these. I don't know why my wife is talking about it. I love it. Uh, it was a practical matter on the right hand side. I love it. Maybe it was much better. Actually, if you look at the problem, seeing in terms of only, let's say, let's focus on the second tier just for, for discussion. I can very well uh, think of a tour. So for example, this one, it's a tour. It's one possible, possible tour which can be executed by a vehicle to move some freight out of that to those two customers. Right? It exists. I can generate it. I can have it. I can have another tour which has to go from here to this one, to this customer, come back. I can generate a tool which actually comes here, goes back. I can generate a tool that goes one, two, three, four, five, assuming I have enough capacity on my vehicle, and then I'm going back. There are a finite number of tools. I'm doing mathematics now. If I have a finite, I have a set of finite number of tools. If it, the set exists, it means that I can generate it. Now, how big it is, who cares? I'm 
Dar nu e matematic format. Don't call me on that. But if I have the tools, now imagine that. I have all my tools in a set. Each tool is characterized by what? It's what customers I have on them. And actually, because I'm no split right now, I'm still sticking to that single problem, I know how much I have to take from that facility in order to go and let the each customer. So I know what the cost of the tool is. Right? So what is the solution? We said it before. A solution is a set of tools. You remember? A solution to the routing problem with 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 with, your, uh, with cluster <coughs> and then with sequence. Well, it's exactly what my little tools does do for each group of customers. I'm building a tool. You know, in a sense, you want to actually know how to do it. Right? You enumerate all the groups of one, two, three, four, five, until you cannot get into the tracking one, and then you solve it. Oh, uh, as you solve simply, my dear, a traveling salesman problem. Why did you take you a while? We know how to do it. It's not for anyone, but that's enough. Then, what is your solution? You have to select a, a subset of tools. How? Why? And what? How? What? The subset that you select, well, they have to actually fulfill the requirement of the problem. So you have to solve, to, 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 to distribute to each customer. So your subset of tools have to visit all the customers exactly once. So you cannot have in your final subset two tours that stop at the same customer. Once you do that, because by building your tours, they are feasible in terms of capacity. Even if you have a, a constraint on the length of the tool, you build it, so you build it feasible. So the constraint is that if you take all the tools and if you say, do I want it? Yes or no? It's a selection again. It's location. Yes or no? I want this one for the second tour. Yes or no? Do I want it? For the 10 million tour. Yes or no? Do I want it? And then for each customer. I have what? I have a sum. The sum of all those tools has to be exactly equal to one for each customer because I have to solve it. Now, obviously, if I have capacity, capacity on the vehicles are already taken care of, construction time. If I have capacity on satellites or on platforms, I have to put that as well. Now, this formulation is called a set partitioning problem. When you allow the customer to be visited more than once, it's called a set covering problem. Fundamental problem in integral programming. Come back with it. The beauty of it, because you say, what the heck? You move from, a, I don't know, a couple of parts to 10 million rounds? <laughs> Yes, if I'm obliged to generate a 10 million route, uh, it's undoable. But there is something which is, which is a, a nice method, which actually allows us to, 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 to generate those tools dynamically, interactively. So I start with a limited number. For example, each customer service directed by a vehicle. Closest one, not here. And then I'm generating at each iteration, I'm looking at my solution and saying, can I generate some other tools that improve my solution? Now, if you remember in the programming, of course, it means can I generate some tools with negative marginal cost? Ah, so I'm generating my tools on a graph, on a 
special love tale deriving from my heart. And it's the shortest part, special shortest part, on national cause. Uh, dancing world of the competition. Other words called common generation. Dancing world is huge. Both of them are true. So fundamentally, this is a methodology of choice if you want to solve exactly large vector routing problem. Now, let's put it this way. Vector routing is still in the home. Which means that at one point, even that could break down. Uh, and when the problems are large, and not, it's not necessarily easy to have a I mean, what I'm saying now is easy. After that, you go to, to dirty your hand and do things. It's much more complicated. Uh, there are a number of many, many papers and a couple of books, including one on common generation, which appeared about what, five, six years ago, uh, when the Gerard was the anniversary, I don't remember. Uh, and there is the methodology is well known. It's the, uh, the same one which is used in. Uh, in cruise scheduling, for example, it was very nice. Cruise scheduling is easier than routing. Machine scheduling is more difficult. Okay. But everything reduces to the same problem. Uh, and you are not obliged to always do exact common generation. You can do heuristic common generation. But anyway, so single index. Okay. Moving the program from arcs to parts. And again, in combinatorial network-based optimization, moving from arcs to parts. It's an exceptionally important uh, methodology. Uh, in linear programming, if you take a flow formulation, minimum cost network flow, the path and the arc are equivalent. In integral programming, yeah, sure. The fact is that you can model some things on paths in a much more easy way than on arcs, including, for example, nonlinearities and discrepancies. <coughs> so it, it opens up, again, we don't have the time to do it in this particular series of lectures, then we do it next year. Uh, but it opens up a lot of possibilities on modeling more complex things. Just to give you an example, truck drivers, everywhere, there are rules, there are Canada rules, United States rules, China rules, Europe rules, Russian rules, everybody. More or less all the same. You cannot drive more than, what, seven, eight, nine hours during the day. During the day. You have to stop after many hours, after three days you have to stop for half a day. If you think about that, how do you put that? Oh, you can write a constraint on that. But you have non-linear stop and non-continuous stop because you have to count from the beginning and when you reach like about 20 hours of time, you have to stop for six hours. You can do it, mathematically, you can do it. Try to put that in a, into a computer program, you're dead. You do it on paths, aha. Actually, you don't even model it. These are conditions in the path generation to have a path which is feasible and respects all of that. Because a path is in a time space method. These are called resource constraint shortest path problem. So, it, it's a beautiful methodological approach. And uh, I better actually move a little bit because I have about 10 minutes left. Yeah, and it's about what I have left to show you. Because actually, I'm not, I have, I, want, I wanted to finish that one by punching you hard with a model, but we just go through it without actually reading. Now, that is the latest work 
We are revising the paper, so it should we should be accepted soon. PhD students are home, writing like crazy because they have to submit before the end of May. Uh, anyway, that's the idea. And the idea is that to have a location routing for city logistics, meaning that you have time-dependent demand, which means that you have time-dependent routes. You have, which means also that you have synchron synchronization at satellites. So we locate on both on both sides. So you see these are the platforms, the square one, and the, the little or wrong the diamonds here are the satellite and the time dependent demand, which means that there is an availability when the demand is available here, and we have to decide what is the platform. So I have a we can pre-compute the cost here in the line. And then I have a time window, hard time window of the customers referring to here. It's a hard one to have. And because of that, these that I have to select the satellite, well the uh, yeah. No, these are the satellites, I'm sorry. The satellites here, these have a capacity, and I have to synchronize the first tier vehicle with the first, second tier vehicle. And I have tools on both sides. Now, um, we did a classical, well, actually, the model which is now, uh, it's a hybrid, and we have both discrete and continuous time. In a moment, and uh, we're actually having something very similar to what I just talked about the dynamic discovery of elements of the probe, you know, the tool, it's a network. There's no, uh, <coughs> not really time to get into all of that. So, now if you look, what this is when you look statically to the problem, this is what you see you have the demand, the platform. Then from the platform you have a tour, you go to the satellite, from the satellite you go to customer. This is a static view, it seems simple. If you go to the time dependent view, nah, it starts to be a little bit less simple. Now these three, now you here you have four demand. These are the origin, these are the destination. Okay? Now it seems that all of them happen at the same time, which is not true. These three can be more or less in the same time available to this platform. The other one, the availability time, puts it here, the best availability time. And then, want to say, this customer has to be serviced before the other one. How do you model that? Well, classically, and I'm not going to get into the detail, you go to what is called a time-space network. Time space meaning that I'm taking all the nodes of the system and I, I'm taking the time and I'm, and I'm measuring it in units. Now, we have units of time here. It all depends, we work by what? By the minute, by the hour, by the day. If you are competition sport, 100 meters flat, you are at a second. If it's me, it's a minute. But in high, in a high performance sport, it's a second. If you talk to physicists, it's a nanosecond. If you talk to geologists, it's a year, 100 million and more. Okay. So, but somewhere there is a discretization which exists because even if time is continuous, we discretize it. So it may be the minute, whatever it is. But now, when you do logistics, minutes, not three. But whatever it is, half a day, the hour, half an, half an hour, the day complete. Okay. What it means that what happened within the period, you don't need to know what time it is, and then you copy your network at each one of the periods. And then you have all the links that move things in time, or which stay from one period. Now, if you do that, it means that all the nodes are there all the time. And this is a discrete time of the network representation. Now, what we did is that clearly some of the nodes in our problem, we do, we do not know 
when they will be active, platform and satellite, they can be there all the time. However, I don't need to have my customers and my origin <coughs> all the time. <coughs> because I, even if I'm waiting or I'm arriving late, there are only certain moments in time where, I, where they exist. Now, by doing that, I have to take care of how am I taking care of central organization. And this is where actually you have actually you have to, to be sure that you are arriving here on time in order to satisfy the demand on time. So I promise you that I will not discuss the model, but you have all the, the, the definitions here. And the only point I want to say that you do have the zero one design viable. And then yes, this is a two index R formulation. However, on the on the commodities is a full monthly interval. And then <coughs> okay. The model well so, so. Okay. you have to select vehicles, tours, the flows at each level inbound to each node, outbound to each node. You cannot use what they didn't, you didn't pay for. Um, this is not split demand. You have to consult, I mean, so you have the vehicle conservation, the flow conservation, and that's the last bit. So it takes two pages. And a full page. Because you actually have to stay. Not only to determine the route, but because you are time dependent, you have to scale. And this is what's missing in most of the papers in the research. Anybody who wants to, uh, let's forget that. Anybody who wants to, more details, would be happy to send you the paper. Uh, and actually, as far as Strategic planning goals, the methodology which is available now is location route in different ways of route. And I would say that this last model, I'm just shoot at it because it's much too complicated to really go into the detail. But I would say that if on location routing, this would, would be now the starting point. My other point is that we could also maybe not look at routing in so much detail by doing network design. Because routing is also design. But that has not been done yet.